symmetric thing for the lower Darboux sum. So this time you get a zero for your first interval, and then you get a one third, and then you get a two thirds. And so this time you end up with three ninth, which is one third. Okay, so of course this is a, a coarse partition and you, you don't get a very good approximation. You, you know only that your integral is between one third and two thirds. Of course it's half, uh, the, the true value is half. Okay, number four. So for number four, we know that we have an integrable function and uh, we have our, but we also know we, we are given a, a number i which is always squeezed between LFP and UFP. So let's see. For every p. But since f is integrable, we know that the integral is also always between LFP and UFP for every partition p. And so, if we uh, multiply across by minus 1, we would get minus UFP less than minus ABF less than minus LFP. Okay, just multiplying this guy by minus 1 across. And now we can add this and that. And we get LFP minus UFP less than I minus, which is also less than UFP minus LFP. Okay, so now remember lemma about absolute value when you have your x between x between minus a and a, this is the same as saying that the absolute value of x is less than a. Okay, we have uh, the two opposite numbers on both sides, so we can say that the difference between i and the integral is less than UFP minus LFP. And that for every P. But now, since we are able to pick any P we want, we know that the difference can be made as small as we want. So for every epsilon, so for every epsilon we know that there exists a P so that UFP minus LFP is less than epsilon. That's the definition of being integrable. Therefore, the difference between i and the integral is less than epsilon for every epsilon. Well, a positive number which is less than epsilon for every epsilon must be zero. That's the only way. Right? No? So, that's something we did a few weeks ago. So remember that 
this is a funny fact. If x is between 0 and epsilon for every epsilon, then x is 0. Well, there are several ways to do this. If uh, you could you could take epsilon equal 1 over n for every n, because it's true for any positive epsilon, and get that your x is between 0 and 1 over n for every n. And therefore, you squeeze it, and you get that your x must be 0. Okay, this is the if you're not afraid to draw arrows. Okay, so you get that your x is necessarily zero, uh, uh, or you do a proof by contradiction. You say it's not zero. Then, if it's not zero, it's strictly positive. If it's strictly positive, take epsilon equal x over two, and you get your contradiction. Uh, anyway, so we get that i minus the integral is zero and we're done. That's Tracy's proof. Um, I had another idea about this proof, uh, which was just to use the the fact that the integral is the greatest lower bound uh, of a lower double sum and the least upper bound. And maybe it's shorter, actually, now that uh, we have gone through the whole thing here. So maybe we should do the other proof as well. So let's do the other proof. So what we are going to, so our starting point is this. For every p, so what we would say here is that i is a lower bound of the upper Darbusans well, we should be of the set of upper Darbusans this is what we want okay from here it's clear that R is a lower bound of the set of upper Darbusans so I must be less than the greatest lower bound of upper Darbusans. But that's exactly the integral of f. So i is less than the integral. Okay, because it's a lower bound, so it's more than the greatest lower bound. Now, uh, you do the other side too, you say you, you say that uh, I is also is an upper bound of a set of lower Darbusans. And therefore, if, if it's an upper bound, it must be bigger than the least upper bound of, up, of, uh, uh, yeah, of the set of lower Darbusans. But because we are assuming that our function is integrable, we know that this is also the integral. 
so i is at the same time less than the integral and bigger than the integral. Therefore, it's equal to the integral. So that's maybe shorter. Six So for A, take f of x equal to arc tangent of x, and uh, we know, know that f is uh, continuous on 0, 1, and differentiable on 0, 1 open. It's actually uh, differentiable everywhere. And f prime of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, that's uh, coming from the derivative of the inverse function of tangent. Therefore, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to say that the integral between 0 and 1 of 1 over 1 plus x squared is f of 1 minus f of 0, which is pi over 4. Because f of 0 is 0, and f of 1, arctangent of 1, is pi over 4. So every time you do the same thing. Do, do I need to go over the others? OK, so if no one is in favor, I'll just skip this. So number seven. So we have a continuous, a continuous function in 0, 1. Okay. And if f is continuous on 0, 1, then f is continuous on 1 over n, 1. Of course, because to be continuous on 0, 1 means that it's continuous at each point of this interval. But this interval is included in this one. Therefore, there is really not much to say. We give an example for which this thing converges as n goes to infinity. Okay, so you could simply take a function which is continuous on 0, 1 close. But I hope you were braver than that and you took something which was not continuous was not bounded, like uh, f of x equal to 1 over square root of x. That's a continuous function on 0, 1. But not on 0, closed 1. So uh, when you look at uh, this thing between 1 over n and 1, Well, between 1 over n and 1, I have no problem. This is a function which is differentiable, which is continuous. I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and say this is actually going to be 1 over half x to the half 1 over n 1. So we are going to end up with 2 times 1 minus 1 over square root of n. Okay, we just integrate, and this goes to 2. So this converges as n goes to infinity. Questions? 
Now for the other one, for C, you want to show that that's not always the case. You may have a problem Uh, if you take f of x equal 1 over x, for instance, uh, yeah, 1 over x. So same thing, it's uh, continuous on 0 up and 1. Uh, when you look at 1, well, uh, or even let's take 1 over x squared. Wh when you look at this between 1 over n and 1, Again, you can use the fundamental theorem of calculus because uh, an antiderivative for this is minus 1 over x, and minus 1 over x is continuous on this interval and is differentiable, has all the properties we need. So you get minus 1 over x to be taken between 1 over n and 1, which is minus 1 plus n. And that, of course, diverges. It's not bounded as n goes to infinity. So this tells you that a single point can break the whole thing. Okay? Uh, we have defined the integral on closed bounded intervals a, b. In some cases, like this one, you can extend your definition in something which is open. But sometimes you cannot. So, uh, usually the terminology is that this is an improper integral. Improper because it's not bounded. So a priori you don't have a right to talk about the integral of this thing. So what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to cut off the point which is posing me a problem, which is zero. And I'm going to put, to put myself at 1 over n. I'm going to see what happens there. And then I'm going to let n go to infinity. Okay. And there are other ways to do this. Uh, physicists, in particular, have been very creative about uh, uh, thinking of uh, uh, different uh, ways to, to get something that does not converge to make it converge. Okay? And sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it does not. But don't tell them. So, nine. We want to show that if f is decreasing, then f is integrable. Well, it's really uh, very similar to what we did for, de for increasing. This is not included in the continuous thing. You see, a decreasing function might be a function like this that uh, has several points where, uh, where it's not continuous. What's interesting about uh, uh, monotone functions on an interval is that the worst that can happen to your monotone function on an interval is countably many points where it's not continuous. So the set of points where it's not continuous is not so bad. And, and then it turns out that uh, you, you have quite a bit of regularity, actually, once you have uh, a monotone function. It cannot, be, cannot behave really very strangely. So what would we do here? Well, we, we write, we, sh we go back to our definition of integrability, which is that I want for any epsilon to be able to find a partition where the upper minus the lower is less than epsilon. So uh, since we, we can pick any partition we want, our favorite partition is always the regular partition. Okay, so that uh, it, it simplifies the computations. And what we are going to do is set x0 equal a, x1 equal a plus b minus a over n. We are on a, b, right? Yeah. x2 is going to be a plus 2 times b minus a over n. And we go all the way to xn, which is a plus n times b minus c over n. So we are adding regularly by steps of b minus c over n. Uh, the upper Darboe sum of this thing is uh, 
times xi minus 1, xi minus xi minus 1. Now, this guy is f of xi minus 1. The highest point of a decreasing function in xi minus 1, xi is going to be the first one. Okay, f of xi minus 1. And this guy here is b minus c over n. So the upper Darboux sum simplifies to b minus c over n, f of xi minus 1. The lower Darboux sum is going to be the same thing, except that you now need f of xi. Because the lowest point in this interval is f of xi. So the only difference is that the i instead of the i minus 1. And now you subtract that. So we are doing upper f of xi minus 1 minus f of xi. So now what is this? Well, it's a telescoping uh, sum. This is f of x0 minus f of x1 plus f of x1 minus f of x2 and so on. The last term being f of xn minus 1 minus f of xn. So as always, everything disappears except for this term and this term. So we end up with b minus a over n times f of x0 minus f of xn, which are uh, really f of a minus f of b. So we end up with b minus a over n f of a minus f of b. Now how do I know that this is less than epsilon? Because that's what I'm trying to show. How do I show that this is less than epsilon? Yes? Okay, but what you want to do really is start with epsilon and say there exists an n so that b minus a over n times f of b minus f of a is less than epsilon. Okay, that's how you would do it. You'd say, I, I can find an n so that this is a true statement. Now, how do I know that I can find such an n? Archimedean property. Okay, so that should be my starting point. Now that I know where I'm heading, I should really go back to my proof and say, I, I have an epsilon, I pick n. Once I have n, I have my partition p, because the partition p depends only on n. And then I do my computation, and hypocritically I find that this is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's that's the way we would write this. Okay, so that was for nine, twelve now.
So we want a, con a function which is continuous on AB open, but bounded on AB. Okay, so typically, so okay, for A, we don't want the function to be continuous at A. So uh, if A is here, we could have a function that does this. And at A, we have this uh, jump. Okay, so this is a function that has this property. It's a bounded function, but it's not a continuous function of the whole interval. Okay, B, we give ourselves uh, an epsilon, and by the Archimedean property, we know that there is n bigger than 4 uh, 4k over epsilon. And that's all we need. Okay, so it's only the Archimedean property here again. show that there is a partition P of A plus 1 over NB so that the difference is less than epsilon. So the thing is that A plus 1 over NB is a sub-interval of AB. So uh, F is continuous <coughs> on the sub-interval. And therefore, integral. Okay, so once again, we we slice a, a piece of uh, our interval so that we can restrict ourselves to somewhere where we know what to do. No, I'm not done. We we'll see. So, integrable means, by definition, that there exists a partition P of A plus 1 over N B such that the upper Darbu sum minus the lower Darbu sum is between 0 and epsilon. Okay, that's my definition, so I know this is true. Okay, now for D, uh, okay, yeah, uh, so Q is going to be the partition obtained by doing A with P. Okay, you, you put a new point. So, I, so what you had was A plus 1 over N, B, and you have a bunch of points here. This is what your P is. And you add A. So you have a, now you have, by adding A, you have a partition of the whole interval AB. Okay, you are going back to your whole interval now. However, when we are going to do the sum, the UFP, Okay, so when you are going to do the difference between UFP and UFQ, uh, you do the same operation. You take your sub-intervals and you look at the height of your rectangle and you multiply by the width. All the rectangles are the same, 
except for the rectangle depending on the first one. Good. Because this rectangle will be in Q but not in P. Okay, do you see that? That's the only difference. So the difference of a sum is just going to be uh, M F A A plus one over N times the difference between your two axes, which in this case is just one over N. And I don't know what the sign of capital M is, so I should put absolute values here because I'm taking the absolute value of the two. And this is less than k over n. Okay, because the, the function is bounded by k. You do exactly the same thing for the lower double sum. You are going to have a lower case m here, but the lower case m in absolute value is also less than k. So you get twice the term k over n. Right? So now, uh, finally, E, there is another typo. Sorry about that. If you want to show that F is integrable on AB, you really need UFQ minus LFQ less than epsilon. That, the, the correct question is, UFQ minus LFQ needs to be less than epsilon. That's what we want. So UFQ minus LFQ you want to estimate this thing. Well, if you have done enough analysis in your life, you know that you should really reintroduce the P in this thing and uh, do something like this. UFQ minus UFP plus UFP minus LFP plus LFP minus LFQ. The reason you do that is that you know how to compare UFQ to UFP, that's what D was about. But then you need to add UFP. Once you have UFP, you think, well, I should put an LFP because UFP can be compared to LFP. And then you get this. So you have three differences. You, you really need to think about this and that and this. And they are all small, so you're done. Okay, because this is less than, so this guy we say is less than k over n. This one is less than epsilon over 2. And this one is less than uh, k over n again. But if I pick my n correctly, my k over n should be less than epsilon over 4. So this is epsilon over 4 plus epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 4. So you end up with epsilon. When, when the number of estimates keeps increasing, it's kind of difficult to keep track. So sometimes what people will do is just say that each term is less than epsilon, and you end up with 3 epsilon in this case, which is not a big deal. It has already happened to me to end up with 31 epsilons. Bad experience. OK, so this concludes that our function is indeed integral. Okay. So I mean, these two problems show to you that a single point can really mess up things. Okay, you may think that uh, uh, just uh, uh, adding or subtracting a point is not going to be a big deal, but it may, it may be a big deal. This problem shows that if your function is bounded, it's not a big deal, which tells you also 
because you, you can now do an induction proof and say, okay, assume that my function has a finite number of discontinuities. What am I going to do? I'm going to slice my interval AB into subintervals where my function is continuous. And by using this argument, I'll be able to show that it's actually an integrable function. Okay, so we can, we can use this as a stepping stone to, to get uh, better results, but I won't do that to you today. Maybe in the final. We'll see. Questions about the homework? Okay. So, we need to finish 6.2. And I think we were about to talk about the integral mean value term. So we assume that f is continuous on a, b, then there is c in a, b such that the integral of f on a, b is f of c times b minus a. Okay, so what is this telling us? Well, you may have any continuous function you want. The area between A and B is really the same as, so for a given C, you so where is f of c? C is here, let's say. Okay. So tells you that the area in blue is the same as the area in black. Believe it or not. Of course, I mean it's it's for a particular c. Thank you, f of c, and c is here. So, it's an interesting proof because we are going to use several things that we know. not an x1 in a b such that m of f of a b is equal to f of x not and capital M of f of a b is equal to f of x1. So why can I say that? Yes, I have a function which is continuous on a closed bounded interval AB. Okay, F is continuous on the closed bounded 
a, b. Therefore, the extreme value theorem applies, and we get this. Okay, then we can write that f of x is between f of x naught and f of x1 for all x in a, b. Okay, the function has a maximum and a minimum which are attained, and therefore any value of the function is squeezed between these two values. Now we can take integrals across inequalities provided a is less than b. Okay, so we can say, well then, the integral of, from a to b of f of x naught is going to be less than the integral of f between a and b less than the integral of between a and b of f of x naught. So this is the function f. But this is the constant f of x naught, and this is the constant f of x1. Okay? The integral of a constant is, of course, f of x naught times b minus a, and this is f of x1 times b minus a. Now, if we uh, divide by b minus a, we get that f of x naught is less than 1 over b minus a f of x1. What kind of object is this thing? Is this a number? Is this a function? Something else? It's a number. It's a number, it's a number because uh, this is a number and uh, dividing by another number you get a number. Now my number is between f of x naught and f of x1. So this should make you think of what? What term? Intermediate value term. Okay? So c call this guy C, can we call No, let's not call it C. Um, so let um, this, let this be d. This is the number d. Okay? Our number d is between f of x0 and f of x1. And the function f is continuous on x0, x1. So there exists a c in x0, x1. I should keep it closed here, such that d is f of c. So, uh, but d is 1 over b minus a integral, and so this thing is equal to f of c, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay? So we get to use the extreme value term and the intermediate value term in this proof. Okay, uh, now why is this useful? Well, in a number of applications, you, you need to look at things of the following type. Um, so. Assume that f is continuous on a, b.
for x in a b define f of x to be the integral from a to x of f. Now, is this well defined? Is this subject well defined? Can I can I do that? And why? Um, yes, well defined. Could you give me a reason? Um, well, because uh, it's continuous, so so we know it's uh, integrable, and uh, since x is uh, within a and b. Yeah, so this is true since f is continuous on Ax for every x in AB. So it makes sense. We can define this thing. This is a well-defined object. Now what's interesting about this is that when you integrate functions, you get more regularity. So you start with a function here, which is continuous. It may not be differentiable, for instance. But when you do this operation, you get a differentiable function. Okay, so that's what we're going to prove now. f is differentiable on a, b. OK? So, uh, how do we do this? We're going to take a sequence. Okay, so we're going to take a sequence where we're going to look at differentiability uh, at the C. So, let C belong to A, B. Then let's take xn that converges to c. And xn is always different from c. Then let's look at f of xn minus f of c, which is, by definition, this thing. Okay, now in order to uh, estimate this thing, it's a good idea to do some uh, uh, addition. We are going to replace this by a, what are we going to do? Yeah, a c f plus c x n, mm, but it's a minus. Uh, so what did I do here? Oh, okay, that's fine. Cxn. Yeah. Cxn minus ac. And what's nice about this is that this cancels with that. So we get f of xn minus f of c equal to this guy here, cxn f. But f is a continuous function, so we can use the integral mean value term. And say that this thing is equal to f of c, uh, let's, let's say cn, times x, xn minus c where Cn is between C and Xn. Now, what can I say about the sequence Cn? 
does CN converge to something interesting? Uh, yes. So to where does it converge? It converges to C because Xn is converging to... Uh, to C. C. Yeah. So you have CN. Yeah. So you have Xn here. And you have C here, maybe. Or maybe it's on the other side. We don't know. But we know that the distance between C and Xn goes to 0. And we have Cn somewhere here. What, what we can say is that uh, um, we can say that Cn minus C is less than Xn minus C. Because Cn is between Xn and C. OK? So this guy goes to 0. Therefore, this goes to 0 too. So Cn minus C goes to 0, which is the same as saying that Cn goes to C. So we are basically done now, because what this is telling us is that f of xn minus f of c over xn minus c is equal to f of Sn, f of Cn. And so I'm going to say now that f of Cn converges to f of C. Why can I say that? Why is it true that f of Cn converges to f of C? <laughs> Continuity of f at C. And therefore, this thing must go to f of c as well, which proves that f is differentiable at c, and f prime of c is really f of c. So we have proved more than we had promised. Okay. We, not only our function capital F is differentiable, but its, its derivative is lowercase f. Questions? So let's stop here.